there's an important facet of trustworthiness we haven't talked about, and that is who decided what books went into the Bible and how can we trust the right books were included? To answer these questions, we have to look at the biblical canon. What is the canon? It's not what it sounds like. It's not a gun that launches a projectile. It's canon, C-A-N-O-N with one N. The word canon we're talking about here refers to how the Bible was put together. Canon comes from the root word read, which was used as a measuring rod and came to mean a standard. As applied to scripture, canon means an officially accepted list of books. Several principles guided the identification and collection of our books that make up the Bible we have today. They're called marks of canonicity. As we examine the marks, you'll notice each one asks a question. So the first mark of canonicity asks, was the book written by a prophet of God? Every book, every book included in here was either written by a prophet or an apostle or someone with a direct relationship to one. We addressed this when we talked about eyewitnesses earlier in the lesson. The second mark asks, was the writer confirmed by acts of God? Miracles, by definition, are acts of God that confirm the authority of those whom God has called to speak for him. For example, God gave Moses miraculous, miraculous powers to confirm his call. The third mark asks, did the message tell the truth about God? God cannot contradict himself or speak what is false. So when one book or author agrees with another, that testifies to the truth of the book referenced, as does historical accuracy. The fourth mark asks, did it come with the power of God? The book had to affirm the truth that God's word is living and active, meaning it had transforming force. So if it didn't have the power to change a life, the early church would not see God behind its message. And the fifth and final mark asks, was it accepted by the people of God? The book had to be accepted by the people to whom it was written and also who shared time and space with the author. If they accepted the book as an authoritative word from God, it was to be considered so. We discussed this in the per first part of our lesson today. As we close our talk on the canon, I don't want to miss this fact. Theologians are careful to note the church didn't develop the canon. God led the decision-making process much the same way he led the authors of the Bible as they wrote. God oversaw and directed the process through his Holy Spirit. The church, over many years of hard work and lots of wrestling, recognized the canon by mutual agreement. Before we end our teaching today, let's look at one more question that comes to mind when we talk about the trustworthiness of the Bible. What about the apparent contradictions, differences, and errors? How do they impact what we've studied today? Because of the number of times the New Testament has been copied over the last 2,000 years, scholars have found some errors and differences between them. So the question is, do these errors and differences affect the reliability of the Bible? Interestingly, when scholars talk on this topic, they choose not to use the word error because they consider it misleading. Error means a deviation from accuracy or correctness, a mistake. The errors scholars have discovered do not affect the reliability and accuracy of God's word. Though they deviate from the base text, they don't affect historical, geographical, spiritual, or scientific facts. So they call them variants. They're things like misspellings, word omissions, differing word choices, slight differences between stories. Let's return to my lawyer days for a moment. If I had two witnesses who gave me the exact same testimony word for word, I would assume they conspired to tell their story to get the result. Why? Because no two people see an event the same. They see it through different eyes, perspectives, personalities, and even emotional states. Slight differences in eyewitness testimony actually lend to its credibility. None of the differences we just talked about threaten the inerrancy or truth value of the message. So I wanna give you a real life example to help understand this better. Let's say I write a letter and copy it 10 times and send it to 10 friends. A few weeks later, I decide, I think I wanna send this letter to Melissa and Kendra but I can't find my original. I can reconstruct my original with a pretty high degree of accuracy if I ask my friends to screenshot me their copies and I compare them. Now I have multiple copies to help me determine the content of my original. So even if in some of those originals I leave out a word or misspell a word or make some mistake that might not be in another copy, 
Comparing the copies would reveal the mistakes and I can reconstruct with certainty what I wrote in my original. Now, when we're talking about biblical copies, we have multiple people, not just one person like me making the copies. So it's even easier to reconstruct an original because it would be rare for different people to make the same mistake. Thus, the more copies of a document that exists, the greater the likelihood it is that an accurate translation can be reconstructed. Josh McDowell writes, scholars testify there is not one essential doctrine of the church that is in question because of the inaccuracy of the text, not one. Not only is the New Testament text we have today very close to the original, the evidence shows that Old Testament text is as well. There are tens of thousands of manuscripts available to check and compare. Modern textual scholars agree with Sir Frederick Kenyon who said, the Christian can take the whole Bible, we can take this whole Bible and say without fear or hesitation, that what we hold in our hand is the true word of God, handed down without essential loss from generation to generation throughout the centuries. God's method, empowered by his wisdom and magnificence to use many authors with different writing styles, personalities, backgrounds, and vocabularies, comes to life in each book of the Bible especially the Gospels. The Gospel writers relay many of the same events, but tell them through their own life experience. Some will focus on one event more than another and give details another did not. We may even see minor contradictions or characters present at one event and not mentioned in the other. This does not invalidate the inerrancy of God's Word, the perfection of His Word. It's simply because the authors are moved, touched, and led by the Spirit differently.